Mr. Thompson may or may not be here. He said that he had another hearing at the same time, but at 9 a.m., but it's 50 minutes past 9. Okay. So he may be here. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I'm calling the case of Tobin versus Stokes. Case number a 19 c Would counsel who is present please identify yourselves for the record? Let's start with plaintiff's counsel. Good morning, Your Honor. John Thompson for the plaintiff. Okay, and Mr. Hong? Uh, yes, uh, good morning, Your Honor. Joseph Hong for the uh, Stokes defendants. Okay, and Ms. Wood? Good morning, Your Honor. Brittany Wood on behalf of the Chessy defendants, Brian and Deborah Chessy and Quicken Loans. Okay, are there any other uh, parties here? Okay, uh, this is uh, defendant's uh, motion uh, for attorney's fees and costs. Oh, I'm sorry, is there somebody else here? No? Oh, we got everybody? Your Honor, my client, uh, Ms. Tobin, is also on the call. Okay, thank you. This is John Thompson. Okay, um, this is defendant's motion for attorney's fees and costs. I'm listening. Good morning, Your Honor. Brittany Wood. Uh, the motion for attorney's fees was supported by a, a Brunzel declaration and redacted billing statements along with a memorandum of costs. And the billing statements confirm that I spent 31.6 billable hours most of which was dedicated to analyzing um, a substantial docket from the 2015 quiet title action, uh, as well as uh, the public record and the appeal documents, and then, of course, my client's purchase documents. Uh, Ms. Tobin's opposition asserts really two, two main arguments. The first is that the 31.6 billable hours were excessive, um, and the argument there is that anything more than a simple one paragraph joinder to Red Rock's motion was unnecessary. And the second argument is that this court's prior finding that Tobin's claims were brought without reasonable grounds can apply to the Chessie defendants. Uh, respectfully, Your Honor, the Tobin's opposition proves that the fees requested were reasonable. Um, it's apparent that Ms. Tobin is likely to appeal this court's finding that the claims are barred by claim preclusion and issue preclusion. And the problem for my clients is that unlike the other parties, they weren't a party to the 2015 litigation. So it was necessary for us to establish privity of title, both for Ms. Tobin and as, as well for the Chessie defendants. And so a substantial portion of the time was dedicated to that. Um, and the opposition also shows the problem that Ms. Tobin still doesn't understand that the privity issue, particularly as it relates to the Chessy defendants, is what establishes that there's issue preclusion and claim preclusion as to these parties as well. And for that reason, we couldn't simply just join into Red Rock's motion um, because those things weren't established in it. And for that reason, we would submit that the 31.6 hours were reasonable and necessary and uh, should be awarded for attorney's fees in the amount of $9,480 and costs in the amount of $308.99. Okay, uh, Mr. Hong, do you have a, a dog in this race? Um, uh, no, I, I don't. <laughs> okay, I don't. Mr. Thompson. Good morning, Your Honor. So um, I, I believe it's been well briefed. Um, however, to get attorney's fees under NRS 18010, you have to show that there's no evidence that the claim was bought, brought with uh, reasonable grounds. And we've outlined the basis why it was reasonable, both now and also based on the prior record. So I mean, first to hit that threshold, there has to be no evidence that the that the uh, amended complaint was reasonable. It was reasonable in light of everything that has happened to Miss Tobin in the prior case. She's had she, she the parties and the judge treated her as an individual party for three and a half years. And at the very end of the case, the judge said, "No, you're not a party as an individual." Now I know Your Honor, in in hindsight, has said, "Well, that order says that." 
Uh, there's privity uh, between her as a trustee and her as an individual, but that was certainly not the case. She did not want to waive her rights to um, lose those claims as an individual. The deed in 2017 to this property was transferred from the trust to her as an individual. So all the parties in the prior litigation knew since 2017 that she claimed and actually had a recorded individual property interest in the property since 2017. So, so it's problematic to say that she doesn't have a right to ask this court after the Court of Appeals said, no, you don't have any rights in the property as an individual based on what happened in that prior district court case. She has a right to bring uh, before this court a de a, an action for declaratory relief the only damages that she sought were regarding the excess proceeds, Your Honor, and she has a right to ask for a declaration as to her standing um, as an individual vis-a-vis -vis this, this deed. Now, um, that's evidence that, that she has um, a claim that's valid. She, she, that, she didn't bring this claim to harass anyone. She didn't bring this second amended complaint to, to foment litigation. She brought it to clarify her rights as an individual in the property, which she had a right to do. So that's the first uh, bar that she has to jump through. If, if that's not met, then no attorney's fees are proper at all. Then we get to whether or not 31.6 hours to file a joinder. Um, the, the argument doesn't make sense because they say, well, we had to spend 31.6 hours of attorney time because we weren't in the prior case. And yet they're joining to a motion by attorneys that were in the prior case. And then the argument was made this morning and in the briefs by, by the, defend, the KZ defendants that they needed to spend most of that time to go through the chain of title and to ensure that. Well, that's why we have title and escrow officers. Those folks can do it much cheaper than an attorney. Back in the old days, before we had those, maybe 60 years ago, we would have to go down to the courthouse. I'm old enough to remember doing title searches um, and having to go down to, sorry, to the uh, county recorder's office and actually search out a chain of title. Things are changed since that time and it's no longer necessary for an attorney to do that. So if your honor finds that there's no evidence that um, Ms. Tobin had a right to bring a declaratory relief action to clarify her right as an individual vis-a-vis -vis the deed, then we argue that the uh, hours spent and hours claimed are extremely excessive. Okay, Ms. Wood. Uh, yes. A again, Your Honor, it, it goes back to the issue of them not understanding privity and specifically the importance of privity as it relates to Tobin as an individual and as it relates to the Chessie defendants. An argument has been made that Tobin doesn't have, is, is not in privity to the trust and that's simply wrong. The Restatement Second of Judgments, sub, uh, Section 41.1a, states that a beneficiary of a trust or estate is bound by a judgment in which the trustee participated in the action. There's no question that Ms. Tobin participated in the prior action as a trustee, so she's bound by that judgment. And in addition, in Bauer versus Harris, uh, it, it states that a person is in privity with another if the person acquired an interest in the subject matter affected by the judgment through one of the parties, such as by inheritance, succession, or purchase. Here the property was transferred from the trust to Ms. Tobin via a wild deed because the trust interest had already been extinguished by the HOA sale, but nonetheless it was a transfer of whatever interest they had which is what a quick claim deed says, whatever interest they have, if any, and in this case it was none, and so she's clearly in privity. And again, that is why the time was spent setting out all of the, the, that factual information, 
preparing a request for judicial notice so that when this does go on an appeal, and it, it seems clear that it will, all of that record will be before the Nevada Supreme Court or the Court of Appeals so that they can review that and say, yes, they were in privity. And this court has already found that the claims were brought without reasonable grounds because it's barred by issue preclusion and claim preclusion. So that's already been established. Um, and again, as for the, the number of hours, um, you'll see that the majority of the time was spent before anyone had filed a motion in this matter. So there wasn't anything to join uh, in at that time. The motion was drafted before I even realized someone had filed a motion in this matter. And when I saw that there was a hearing date, we changed what was a motion to dismiss that would have been filed on its own into a joinder so that we could have the same hearing date rather than having multiple hearing dates, which would have just further increased the cost. So again, respectfully, I would say that the hours spent were reasonable, um, that the result achieved uh, justifies the amount that we've requested in attorney's fees. Okay. Counsel, I, I would have to agree. I've, I've gone down this road um, uh, previously. I've already made my decision. Now I need to uh, look at, uh, I mean, I've already made a decision that uh, on, on behalf of the Stokes defendants that um, these were brought without reasonable ground. Um, I'm going to need to uh, review the attorney's fees, uh, which I have not had a chance to do, and I apologize to you for that. This week I've been in a, a full week bench trial, so I have not had a chance to actually go through uh, the itemization, but I'm going to go through it and um, consider them in light of uh, the Brunzel factors. So uh, give me just a little time to do that, and I will do that. I'm going to take it under advisement. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Okay, let's go to page six.